Hello, and welcome to the Artificial Podcast, with your host Nick Myers. Artificial Intelligence. Voice Recognition. Machine Learning. Robotic. Actionable Analytics. It is Nick's goal to help everyone understand how AI and voice technology are reshaping our lives both personally and within organizations. Your glimpse into the growing world of AI and voice first starts now. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Welcome to the Artificial Podcast. My name is Nick Myers, and I am here to help break down topics in artificial intelligence and voice first to show everyone how these technologies are going to impact our lives both personally and within organizations. The Artificial Podcast is brought to you by Red Fox AI, helping give brands a voice to the power of AI and voice assistant technology. Hey there, Artificial Podcasters. Welcome back to another episode and another week of the Artificial Podcast. And this week, I am extremely excited to welcome Ryan Lush from S2A Modular to the show. And I had the pleasure of getting to meet Ryan. Well, I'll have a really good discussion with him a couple of weeks ago now through a, um, a mutual colleague and friend. Uh, he connected Ryan and I. And let me just say that some of the stuff that Ryan has worked on and what he's currently working on in renewable energy tech is just incredible. So this is going to be a great episode for you all. But a bit about Ryan Lush here before we get going. Ryan is the Chief Sales Officer of S2A Modular. Ryan was born with an intrinsic fascination for technology and with more than 20 years of experience in the industry, Ryan's passion and knowledge has driven his success. He specializes in renewable business development and is an expert in combining the smartest, greenest, and most superior solutions in the industry. From starting his own PC repair business in the 1990s to helping pioneer a managed network services company in Southern California, Ryan has been a continuous innovator in tech with a unique ability to educate clients and communicate effectively throughout the duration of any project that he is a part of. Ryan, welcome to the Artificial Podcast. How are you? Thank you, Nick. I'm doing well. Yeah, I uh, like I kind of let in here. I just The last discussion we had just was incredible and, and blew my mind in so many ways. I always love when I get connected with folks like yourself who just have such an open mind when it comes to technology and, and you just know so many fascinating things about different areas of tech that, you know, we sometimes, you know, mention on the artificial podcast, but never really dive into. So I'm really happy to be able to chat with you here. Awesome. Glad to be here. Yeah. So to kick things off, you know, when we first chatted, you, you you dove into your backstory, which I, I think is really cool. So why don't we start by, you know, maybe tell me a bit more about, you know, what is your background, your story and, and what led you to your current role at S2A Modular and working in renewable technology? Sure. Yeah, I guess, you know, when I was a kid, I was uh, privy to a lot of computers back in the 80s when everybody thought that uh, we'd never need them. And uh, so I was really just that kid that just really enjoyed playing games. And then, you know, I'd uh, get irritated if the sound card didn't work or, (laughs) you know, the video wasn't as well as it could be. So I just really got into, you know, grabbing the manuals, learning how to fix stuff. And I just really loved it. And Got, got a big fascination into the whole computers and everything. So it just kind of steered me in there naturally and um, just kept going through life. And all of a sudden I just found out that I just was knowing a lot more than a lot of people that were actually doing it for a living. So I was mm-hmm. like, oh, well, maybe then I'll make a living at it too. Why not? This is fun. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So that's kind of how I got started in it. And then uh, went on to school and got, a, got an associate's in computer electronics and then went into the bachelor's with telecommunications. And, you know, when you're just passionate about tech and you work with people and you just, you just meet more people and opportunities come. And I just kept going to what looked like the most fun. And as long as there was enough money in there to make a living, I was like, I'm going to that one. This one's fun. This one's yeah. exciting. That, no, that's, that's really that's- how I got it. Yeah, that's a great story. I mean, it, you know, you started your own companies really early on. Um, I mean, how did, how did that impact you to the point that you're at now, just kind of throwing yourself into really kind of running your own your own businesses and being a part of some others on the ground floor? Yeah, you know, it was it, back in the days of Windows 95, it was, you know, that was a big thing when everybody was making that move out of 3.1 and getting into Windows 95. And I just started kind of really just upgrading people's machines and their hardware. And I was working for a guy and he just started getting older and older and he's just was like, hey man, why don't you just take this thing over? So that's what I did. And 
um, just started getting into newer things and started networking them in businesses mm -hmm. and started to realize that, you know, people were in that band-aid fix mode of business where, you know, the, the computer guy was, you know, he was kind of hoping your system would go down because then you'd call him and he'd make an <laughs> hourly wage off you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I uh, started learning about managed services and kind of, you know, just in a nutshell, it's like an all you can eat, right? You kind of mm -hmm. you give somebody a flat rate and all you can eat plan and you take care of everything. And I started doing that. And I was in Orange County, uh, started a company called Affordable PC, ended up selling that to a guy. And then I moved out to the uh, Temecula area of California, Southern California. And I just said, you know what, this, this all you can eat plan, this is a better way to go. People like it better. Um, mm -hmm. it, it makes more sense. You know, we didn't have a whole lot of remote connectivity at that time. So it was still a lot of site work, but you know, you were making those runs and then it just evolved into more remote and that, that's how everything started. And, um, and then I just kind of moved in Nick. It was, it, it was a natural progression. I, I started learning about, you know, home automations and people were asking mm -hmm. about things like solar and, you know, what do we do about um, automating my home? So I started getting into Crestron programming and it was just a natural evolution for all this technology stuff to kind of fit into the, the building world and the home world. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's a really interesting progression that you had there from everything you worked on. And I mean, especially, you know, working with S2 Modular now, it just seems like such a perfect fit based on everything else you've told me about that you've done too. And I mean, you know, renewable technology, renewable energy technology is, is something that I feel like isn't talked about often enough. And, and after talking with you, I now feel like it, I don't know why it hasn't been and it should be because this is, this is truly world changing stuff here that's going to affect the outcome, I think, of everything heading into the future, especially currently we're dealing with the problems of climate change and just pollution everywhere we look in general. Um, yeah. And the fact that, you know, we'll get into a bit more here when when you maybe talk a bit more about S2A modular, but it's just, it's just incredible stuff. So with that in mind, you know, what is the current state of the renewable energy tech industry? And, and again, you know, it's, it's a facet of technology that after we talked a couple of weeks ago, I started looking more into myself. And, you know, I, I think from what I gather, when, when most people hear renewable energy tech, of course, they think of wind power, they think of solar, they think of some of these, you know, high level things. But what is the current state of, of this industry and how do you foresee it growing over the next few years? Gosh, well, I mean, you know, just, just a couple of days ago, the $1.5 trillion infrastructure bill for going pro solar, pro, uh, pro storage is being proposed right now. So, you know, that gives you any indication. That's of amazing. Where we're going. I mean, it's, you know, it's been an industry that kind of started out slow, you know, in the beginning it was, it was expensive. Solar didn't really always make a lot of sense. And as, the years have gone by, it's become more affordable, it's become more efficient panels, the equipment's got better. And everybody's realizing that, you know, you don't, you don't need to be dependent on an antiquated grid anymore. You know, we, everybody knows the stories, especially here in California where I'm at, it's, you know, we have fires and these are popping transformers and you're know, rolling blackouts and it's just real unpredictable. And if you can get yourself into a situation where you're gonna have a net zero home, you know, or even a net positive home, then that's real attractive to people now because it's a, it's affordable. It's, it always comes down to that, right? It always comes right. down to cost. So it's become that. It's become affordable. It's become something that really just makes sense to be using renewable energies and get us, like you said before, let's get off these fossils and let's start looking at new solutions and better solutions because they're out there. It isn't the future. It's, it's here. It's already happening. So let's implement them and let's, let's make the world a greener place. Yeah. And I, I think for most people, you know, because we've, you know, a lot of people have just grown up in this world where it's always been one way of doing things. So it's hard, I think initially for a lot of folks to wrap their head around like, wait, I can build a home that's completely self-sustainable and actually can give energy back into the grid like that. <laughs> even, even when I first started talking with Dean, of course, who, who we both know about this when he was telling me he was getting involved in, in S2A and the work you're doing, I was like, wait, that can be done. And, and then once you start learning about it and you know, talking with people like yourself, it's just like, why is it taking so long for us to even get to this point, right? Yeah. Um, and I know one of the fascinating things that you told me about last time we talked is you mentioned something about there being a difference between certain types of solar panels. Like people will, there's certain groups of folks who will sell like this one type of solar panel that isn't necessarily like the greatest, but you guys use something different. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
Sure. Well, we, we have, with, with S2A Modular, we have an exclusivity um, that we use a proprietary panel. It's, it's using Graphene, the company that we partner with, our strategic partner. It's, it's really interesting because, you know, for all of your listeners that don't know what Graphene is, I'd highly suggest just go to YouTube. I wouldn't even go to Google. I'd go to YouTube and just watch the videos. It's, it's a one atom thick material. It was um, discovered in 2005. They got a Nobel Prize for it in 2010. What, what makes it so exciting is, first of all, it's, it's the thinnest and strongest material known to man. It's Incredible. 400 times stronger than steel. It's, it's thinner than a human hair. It's an amazing material, and, it, and it's used for so many things. It's just when you, I mean, like, you know, the Israeli fighter planes are being built with this. I, I've heard Homeland Security is making full body armor out of it. Which is it's funny. I remember you, you mentioning that, and I was like, wait, that's like the equivalent of vibranium in Marvel, and it's real. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so that, you know, that's, those are the, some of the amazing features and benefits of the material itself, but you know, what they kind of found out was it's also a superconductor, meaning it's, um, you know, the, it's the conductivity of it is amazing. The way it pulls photons in is just superior to any other material out there. So in essence, these panels that they got, and they got uh, 20 worldwide patents on it, and, you know, it's really exciting. It's not, it's not that, hey, this is a better panel. It's just a brand new technology, and it just allows people to now get systems that will start accruing energy, you know, anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour earlier and, mm. you know, another 45 minutes to an hour later. So it does a couple of things for you, right? It, it allows you to have a smaller system, which is obviously going to be a smaller cost and still be able to produce what you need, right? And if you produce the amount of energy that your home needs, now you have a net zero home. Well, if you're producing more energy than your home needs, now you have a net positive home. Now you get to feed some of that stuff back to the grid. And now there's a FERC 841 order. It's a federal order that's basically told the investor owned utilities mm -hmm. that we don't have to sell back to you anymore. We can start going to the wholesale market and even get more compensation. So when you really look at it at the end of the day, is it possible that your home can create residual income for you? Absolutely. Just create your own power. And that's, that's really exciting yes. to a lot of people. You know? Absolutely. And, and that's one of the things I was actually going to ask you too, is, you know, if you wanted to explain the difference between net zero and net positive, because of course, I think a lot of people have heard of net zero, of course, but net positive where you're actually creating so much energy within your renewable home that you're able to, to sell that back off into the grid. I mean, that, that's a super appealing. I would think that'd be appealing to a lot of people. Well, absolutely. I mean, like we're, you know, at S2A, we're, we're doing what's called the Bahia Villages. This is a 55 and older community, right? When, as we all know, people, you know, 55 and older and get into retirees, a lot of them are on fixed incomes. So, you know, but I'll give you an example. My mom, for example, I feel like a horrible son sometimes because she's, she's throwing a party because she saved $40 or $60 that this month, <laughs> right? I'm like, oh my gosh, mom, I need to start sending you a little money or something. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't know. And, uh, you know, but that's, it's a reality. I mean, that's where people really are. So when you start talking about somebody, you know, at the end of the year, not only just getting, you know, a few hundred dollars back, but possibly getting a few thousand and that's coming back to you because of your home, that's a big deal. Not just in the 55 and older, just for everybody. And, right. and you're, and you're, you know, you're, we're making the world a greener place. It just makes a lot of sense all the way around, especially for homes and commercial buildings and everybody just get off that grid. It's, it's not reliable. Right. Well, and maybe this is a good transition then into, so, you know, maybe let's talk a bit about if, you know, as much as you can share with me, what is S2A Modular, the company that you work for and how really are you guys working to change the residential property industry as we know it? Sure. So, well, here's, we look at S2A Modular this way. So obviously we build in a modular method, but we're, we're really a tech company and that's how we really look at it. We're a tech company. We're laser focused on renewable energies and sustainability. We just happen to deliver all these technologies through modular building methods, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, ADUs, back houses, ADUs and accessory dwelling unit, but it's like a back house, a grand yeah. flat. And we maybe quick those. for, for those who aren't familiar with modular homes, can you explain that quick too? Sure. Just a modular home is the same as a stick built home. The conventional stick built that you see people out there on the out, outdoors, just hammering away and building homes. We just happen to do it inside of a building. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So when you look at the MLS, it lists our homes as single family residents, just like a stick built home. We're not mobile homes. We're not manufactured homes. They're, they're the same. It's a superior built. You got a quality assurance. They're done extremely quick. The time savings, we can build a home in one week, God, literally inside of a factory. So you, you think about the time saving, you think about people that are building and, you know, they got these construction loans and they're waiting, they're paying a construction loan until the house is built. Now they're yeah. paying a mortgage. Yeah, that's a lot of holding costs. So there's a big savings right there. The quality control that we have inside of a factory, we can build to one sixteenth tolerance, right? So it's just a superior built home. And we, we, we add a lot of different features to it, Nick, like, um, for instance, we our crawl spaces, so from the ground up to the top of the roof is completely controlled, insulated, everything. So it's it's a real controlled environment. And then you start considering that the houses are engineered with us. We engineer these to run on batteries, mm-hmm. just from the inside out. So everything runs on a battery. It's meant to. So we have the lowest voltage, lowest amperage homes on the planet. And then when you start adding things, the other things we do, you know, it's a big holistic approach. It's the windows, it's the, you know, insulation, it's everything. And we're, we happen to be mm-hmm. um, an active member of the United States Hemp Builder Association. Yeah, so, this was so cool too when you told me about it. Yeah, so we're using the organic building materials, which we there's massive advantages in that. I mean, one one is obviously the cost, but you start taking into consideration that, you know, things like hemp, they're, they're fire reflective. So you, now we have fire reflective homes that can't get termites. They can't get dry, uh, dry rot. You can't, they don't mildew. They actually fossilize, meaning they get stronger in time. So you, t- you take all these different things and you start looking at, hey, our stuff goes made with it. Our insulation is made with it. Our drywall is made with it. You, and you just keep adding to the list of everything. You're just building a a, a much more sustainable, healthier home. One of the other things people, you know, in this day and age we're at with COVID and everything, everybody's obviously extremely concerned about their health. And, right. you know, the, think of babies and, you know, the elderly and even just everybody in the walk of life. But another factor of hemp, Nick, is that it will convert CO2 into nitrogen. So you can start taking that parts per million of CO2 and strip it out of your home. You're going to have an extremely Man. healthy home. <laughs> and you, like I said, we, we do our, we so do, cool. You know, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really awesome. And it's, you know, we've learned a lot to be quite honest with you. When you get involved in these organizations, we learn and then we listen and we, we try and find out what is the benefits of it? What is applicable? So you look at a community, like I said, we're doing these Bahia villages, a 55 and older community. Think of that set, you know, 72, 75 homes in one neighborhood, one little uh, community. And they're all converting CO2 into nitrogen. I mean, we're going to have greener bushes. We're going to have healthier air. You're going to have less respiratory problems. You're going to, it's just going to, it's just a healthier environment. And it's all with the materials that you're using to build it, which is just even more incredible. Right. Well, and that's the thing, you know, aside from the materials you're using to build it, you're packing these things full of technology too, aren't you? Absolutely. Yeah. We, we have a, we have a proprietary smart home app. So, if you, you know, if you look at a lot, they say uh, there's statistics out there, but you know, 80% of the people that have a smart home only use about 20% of those features. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, you know, there's just, I mean, like people walk, you walk into your house and you say, Hey, play Led Zeppelin four. That's not a smart home. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a different view of it. So what we've kind of done is we said, look, th- there's an app for my nest thermostat there's an there's an app for my ring camera my ring doorbell camera for my windows for my solar there's too many apps and what we've done is found a proprietary app that we developed with a partner and we can now plug in all of these into one app and you can put your house into modes so awesome. Nick, imagine yeah you, you you take off for the weekend the wife and the kids and You know, you go, oh my gosh, did we turn off this? Did we turn off that? It doesn't matter. You can control your home from anywhere on the planet. And you just go, hey, we're in vacation mode. Boom, hit vacation mode. It's going to shut off everything except your alarm clocks and your router. And now you're not using any of that. Another thing that's really cool, Nick, is the sockets that are in our walls, those are smart sockets. 
as well. And those are also a proprietary thing that we've got through a partner, but um, those, those will shut off the circuit. So a lot of people don't think about it, right? If something's mm-hmm. plugged in and if it's turned off, it doesn't mean it's not still pulling the drop. Right. Yeah. So that, that helps in that aspect as well. So just, it's all, it's about that holistic approach, right? You're just, you're always trying to find out how to use less energy and, you know, just be more sustainable, just, and use the renewable energy that you can and use those batteries. Right. And I can imagine, you know, while you're, you know, maybe while you're on vacation and the home itself is using less energy, it's still probably collecting energy, right? Which can then be put back into the grid. Literally. You'd nail it. Absolutely. Awesome. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I, that's what I told you before we started talking. I'm like, man, I want one of these now. <laughs> right. And, and that's what happens. We, you know, everybody, they start to hear about it and they start to see it. And, you know, we got our factories in uh, Southern California, one in Northern California. We're, we're expanding. We should have nine done before the end of 2021. And then within the next three years, maybe four years, we'll have 35 of these factories across the nation. So, right. And know, anybody, pretty, if you own a plot of land, anybody can get one of these or will be able to at some point, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we're doing them nationwide. That's fantastic. You, you hear that folks keep this on your radar, especially for somebody who's maybe looking to buy a home in the next couple of years. Just wait, just wait. <laughs> to get one of these because oh my gosh they're so cool i'm like i'm i'm kind of at that point now ryan we're like please just take my money i want this now (laughs) (laughs) yeah we're 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 delivering uh already um q q1 of 2021 these will be delivered all over southern uh northern california and even stretching out towards the middle of america and we're we're, we have an expansion plan and people can go on the website and see but it's really accelerated and you know we've got cities that are just really just all, very, very welcoming. They want us up there. We're going mm-hmm. into Patterson and they're just excellent to work with. And the local uh, companies up there, you know, coming to us, they're not wanting us to build developments and housing and even attainable housing. They're calling now. Everybody used to know it as affordable housing. Now the new term is attainable housing. So we're, you know, they're looking at us to do those kind of things. We can do them. We can do them less cost, better builds. It just, it makes a lot of sense all the way oh, around. Yeah. I mean, this, We're just excited. You, you guys are going to disrupt this, this industry so much. And I, I'm all for it because it's, you know, it's one of those things where the way of constructing homes and even commercial buildings for so long, has just been the same way. And, you know, as much as, you know, as much as many people will say we've progressed in terms of energy efficiency and all these things, it, it, it I, I personally don't think it stacks up to what you guys are doing here. I mean, this is true renewable energy technology condensed into a home environment, unlike anything I've heard of or seen before. So I, I'm so excited for you guys. This is incredible. Thank um, you. Yeah. With all that in mind, do you think more people, you know, in all parts of the U.S. and you know, even internationally, maybe at some point are at some point going to consider investing in a, a self-sustaining modular home versus a, a conventional home as it currently is now? I, I think it would be a natural progression, right? I mean, it, it's, it's like anything. It's like, it's safety in numbers. Once you start seeing them and you start really, it, it, there's an education incline. People look at it and some mm-hmm. people think it's, you know, the Jetsons. They think it's future. Yeah. That's not. The, the technology's here today. It's, it's just, who's going to put it all together in one holistic view and do it and you know that's what we've really been working our butts off to do and we want to make that happen and uh we've we've been able to do it and successfully prove that we can show net zero like i said that bahia villages those are that's an off-grid communities first first ever in north america that we know of that's been approved to be a completely off-grid community so we've proven the technology the engineering's there it's just um, getting it out there and people seeing it, I think uh, people are going to flock to it. I don't think, I think yeah. it would absolutely be a, a no brainer for anybody that sees it and goes, okay, this is real. Right. And why am I living this old way? I, we always make a joke within the company. We go, Hey, you know, anybody that still reads by candlelight? <laughs> no, nope. not, not that not I can think bulbs. of. <laughs> right. Just the natural progression. Well, I mean, you know, I, I think about it too, where, you know, of course we're hearing more and more and more now as we should be about climate change and of course the impact that it's going to have on everything. And I, I think for a lot of people, a lot of people that, that I personally know and talk to want to help, but it's like, what, what can I do to help reduce my, 
you know, carbon emissions, you know, in my own life? What can I do to make my life more energy efficient? And I think it's, it's challenging for a lot of people because it's, it's just by the nature of how things have been done in our current home environments. It's, you know, it's what can you do, but what can you do is something like this. If you truly want to help, you know, become more energy efficient, reduce your overall carbon footprint, doing something like this, where you're, you're investing in a home that is using these materials that are helping with the environment and are, are essentially creating net positive energy from a renewable means. I mean, if, imagine if everybody in the U.S. had one of these things. Oh, my gosh. Like, right. That would be the true fight against climate change, in my opinion. Absolutely. It'll make a huge difference. Fascinating. And it's so cool. So what are some of the biggest, you know, quote unquote, myths when it comes to renewable energy tech or renewable energy in general? And, and if you have any or know of any, what are some of the debunks that you can offer for them? Yeah, I guess, you know, it, when I look at it, for me personally, being involved in the industry for so long, one of the, you know, I guess I, I always say it's like a dirty little secret is they, they didn't, nobody ever wanted to talk about the degradation of the panels. And, and that's a reality that people were buying these things, you know, and I won't name any companies, but people know who they are. And back in the day, they were coming up with some panels that, you know, four, five, six years later, these things just weren't producing. They degraded so yeah. much. And that, and that advancement has just happened so much, especially like with us with the graphene, our panels will guaranteed in 25 years, you're going to be producing at a minimum of 96 and a half percent. So now you're talking about decades of renewable energy and not having to worry about that. I think that's the, one of the biggest um, misconceptions that are still out there. The people that have knew about it, you know, eight, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, were like, oh, they just don't last. They're not there. That, those days are long gone. And, and the affordability is just so much more efficient. And unfortunately, you know, there's some companies and salespeople out there that, you know, they don't like to be so forthright, to be quite honest with you. And, you know, when you, when you hear about people that get stuck in these bad deals and these bad things, I think people just get that sour taste and they just put their hands up and push it back. Yeah. And, nope. Nope. I've heard too many things. And I think people just need to, you know, start, start being a little more open and accepting to what's really happening and look at the companies and the housing and everything that's happening. They're actually doing it and really look at the, the numbers because it, it makes a whole lot of sense. And like you, you said it best, Nick, you know, a lot of everybody's like, I want to do more. I've always wanted to do more. I've always, and who, mm -hmm. there's not anybody out there that's like, hey, forget it. I don't care about the environment. Everybody cares. Everybody right. cares about the world we live in. We want to do stuff, but it, it's always been something that seemed pie in the sky or maybe too expensive or too much of a involvement. And they just right. forget it. I'm sticking with what I know. And it, th those days are over. It's time. It's go ahead and start looking into it because it's much more affordable. It's much better for the environment and it's only going to get better as we go. Just, I mean, it's quarter by quarter. You see prices drop in renewable mm. energies constantly. So, and well, you know, there's, I think it was Mark Twain that said, right. It's one thing about land. They're not making any more. We don't have <laughs> yep. enough housing. <laughs> and that's, no, that's, that's, that's absolutely true. And yeah, I, I guess, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to think about that too, where you, you really can't make any more land really per se. So, you know, the, the land space that we have, we're going to have to become, you know, a hundred, a, a, a hundred thousand, a million times more efficient at managing that land and Absolutely. making efficient use of it because we can't create more of it. Um, which I, I think that that's one of the more interesting things about all of this as well. So when we look at renewable energy tech, you know, I know you talked about one of the reasons that, you know, it, it's taken a bit longer than maybe some other technologies to become adopted is because of the cost. But with the cost being reduced so much now, do you, do you feel like there's been anything else that, that's been a holdback to this or is, is this just part of a, a progression more or less? I, I think just from being in the industry, I think it's always been a cost thing. I think it always yeah. comes down to dollars for people. But um, again, I think, you know, people got burned with, what, what's, what the past was like and I, those days are over. So I, I think really that when people start looking at everything and understand that things are different and they are more affordable and they are much better quality and longer lasting, I think that we're going we're gonna to see those misconceptions erase real soon. Yeah, I, I would agree with you completely. Like, like I said, I, I personally have for a, a while now been trying to, you know, do as much as I can in my life to try and, 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 
you know, become more energy efficient and reduce my carbon footprint. But again, it, it's just hard because like he, I think immediately the thing that pops into my head is reduce, reuse, recycle. Well, that can only go so far, right? You know, I'm still sitting in, in, in you know, my home that is being run on electricity that more than likely is obtained from fossil fuels and the more devices and things that I use, the more electricity. So you know what I mean? Like this, oh, yeah. this is truly a way to, to help the, the bigger problem and, uh, and situation at hand here, which is why I love it so much. Um, so one of the technologies I, I want to talk about here quick that I know we talked about in our conversation a couple of uh, weeks ago is Li-Fi. Um, and this is truly fascinating, Li-Fi. So for those who may not have heard about this, I'm, I'm really excited to, to have Ryan talk about this. So, so Ryan, what is Li-Fi? How does it work? And, and why is it a game changer for Wi-Fi as we know? And I know there's some things you're working on with this with S2A as well. Yeah, it's so... Wi-Fi basically, in a nutshell, it's an invisible light. It's not a frequency like Wi-Fi. It's, it's an invisible light. It comes out of a light bulb and it's line of sight. That one of the best things about it, like we were talking about the smart homes, Nick, is you know one of the things that I said that earlier that one of the things that stops people from moving into that smart home realm right now is the fact that there's so many apps. But the other mm-hmm. thing is, is that they're, they're really insecure and people are worried about being hacked and you know being looked right. at well, it's an unhackable technology for one so that's really important to understand that you cannot hack it because you have to have a line of sight so somebody can't just sit outside your home and even see the signal it's an invisible right. light you have to have a device that grabs it so that's a big piece of it and then we talk about you know the the internet of things and the connectivity and the more devices these you can add a hundred times more devices connected to this than you can any Wi-Fi solution out there. And it's faster. It's like a hundred times faster than Wi-Fi. Man. So right now it's a military, hospitals, uh, universities. It's implemented now, but now we're starting to do it in the residential space. And, you know, it took a little convincing for vendors and stuff that are using it to think that it would be applicable, applicable right now in a residential situation. But we show why it does make sense in the home because I mean, are you, I'm sure you've seen it, Nick. I've seen the videos on the internet and everything where, you know, some, some guy gets into a, a ring door camera and he's talking to an yes. eight year old kid. Yep. <laughs> That's scary. It's very scary. It's really scary. So when you start looking at technologies like this, that make that impossible, then why wouldn't it make sense in the residential space? And I, I think, you know, one of the things we do at our company and we feel we're pretty good at is we try and challenge engineers and we challenge people all the time and our own partners challenge to say, instead of saying, here's what engineering gave us and now let's apply it. We're saying, no, we want to apply it this way. You go back and re-engineer this so it works this way so it fits to what people need and what what really benefits us. And I think that, you know, just taking that kind of paradigm shift and really challenging and asking for more, you're going to get it because you're proving that, that it's a need. And that, that's what right. we've kind of done and open up the doors with stuff like Li-Fi and different, different technologies. Well, I mean, think about how many light sources are in an average home too. Imagine if, you know, maybe you guys are working on this, but even just imagine the future where every light in your home could be a Li-Fi receiver. I mean, that's right. just, <laughs> it's, it's so crazy and cool. And I, I love it because like... Like yeah. when I envision the future, I envision stuff like that where you can yeah. just like information is transmitted via light waves, which I know it is now with fiber optics and stuff, but like, you know, Wi-Fi as we know it today is, is still, you know, radio waves. Um, That's right. So this, this truly is, is in my opinion, a, a true game changer in the home. And I can imagine this at some point, maybe being dispersed into, you know, you walk into a retail store and you connect to their Wi-Fi, or you walk in, you know, any, any, you know, physical space, really, I can just envision this working really well. I, I think that we're going to start seeing it um, just from the vendors that I talk to. And there's a couple of big players out there right now. And, you know, they'll, they'll all fight their way out in it. But I, I don't think it's that far away, to be honest with you, to where it's yeah. going to be a mass use. I, I think we're, look, we're, we'll be seeing it used a lot within the next year. Well, and you said some of the, the tech companies, Amazon, some others are already starting to develop or put Li-Fi receivers in some of their hardware too, right? Oh, that's definitely in the plans for a lot of, a lot of vendors. They, they realize it. They know people are going to want this. And, you know, once, once it becomes available and everybody starts to 
recognize it, I think you'll start seeing a big paradigm shift from why, why, why use the radio frequencies and damaging and you know, those things go through your body. They go through walls, mm-hmm. they go through everything. It's, you know, and, 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 you know, people are afraid of different things. I mean, people, people are worried about 5g, right? right. So it's, I think it's just, everybody's becoming more conscious and, you know, we're, we're in a different world right now. And I think everybody's just being a lot more aware of everything that can affect themselves, the, the whole environment, the, the whole world. Right. No, yeah. I, I agree with you completely. So, you know, that, that's Li-Fi, which is incredible all of itself. But from your perspective, how do you think, you know, other emerging technologies like AI, um, voice assistant tech, um, will affect the work that you do or the technology that you choose to put into your homes moving forward? Yeah, that, you know, that, and I think everybody knows, you know, everybody has an Alexa and they know how those work. And you know, people are talking into their phones for text now. But, you know, start thinking about all the things in your home that can start learning your behaviors and learning, you know, that is simple as, you know, a vacuum robot, right? It takes the AI reads can tell and sense when your floors are dirty and just starts cleaning it based on learning your home. I think we're going to, those are the things that seem so small and not a big deal, but it's the right. littlest things like those, but you know, we're going to get into even more and more types of AI where they're really learning our behaviors. And you know, that, that kind of scares people too, right? You got robots right. out there learning us, <laughs> but as, you know, as long as you, uh, understand it and you know apply it properly there's there's going to be a lot of great advantages to those kind of things and you know the ai's they're, they're learning our bodies and our dna yep. point so the, the things that are going to happen are just amazing that we're, where we're at i just i wish i could live another 100 years right you know, that's me exactly too <laughs> yeah and i think the home when we start looking and dissecting some of these these technologies like ai voice li-fi iot all of it the home is really the perfect spot i think for all of it to collectively come together because you know i i, I gave a talk on um, a tedx talk on ai last year and and i i led into it with like imagine you walk into your home and you're greeted by your you know voice assistant who, whatever that is and it, it just automatically like knows your life is scheduling appointments for you set your clothes to dry cleaning all this other stuff because it's all connected and you know your your groceries are automatically ordered because the sensors in your fridge detected oh you're out of milk you're out of butter and then it automatically orders it and the drones come and drop it off and you know when you're in your home it recognizes what your sleep wake schedule is so your voice assistant knowing that you have to go on vacation books your airline ticket according to your sleep wake schedule like all that stuff is going to happen i don't know your thoughts on my crazy my crazy future there no, I, I agree with you completely. And I think it's just going to be that acceptance time. When is it going to, you know, how long is it going to take for people to see it and understand like the masses finally go, yeah, forget it. This is working. This is cool. I like it. Right. I mean, look, well, look at Tesla. We got self-driving cars. There's people that still go, I'm afraid of that. Right. But <laughs> they're seeing that it's, it, it's, it's real. It's here. It's right. What's, What's, what's funny too about, I'm happy you brought up the Tesla thing because I, I still find it. It's like, I love it so much because I'm such a tech geek. When I see some of those videos where the people are literally passed out at their steering wheel and the car's, <laughs> the car's driving itself. It's scary. <laughs> it's scary. I, I saw a video on TikTok actually just yesterday where I, uh, someone had one of the cars, but they were sitting in the back seat just kind of filming around and the car was just driving by itself on the road. And I'm like, it's like uncomfortable, but so cool at the same time, because this is like, this is here already that yeah. we can do this, um, which is pretty incredible. I, I love all this stuff. So um, with all this in mind, you know, what concerns you the most maybe about the future of technology and the role that it'll play with our lives? Is there anything that you're, you're hesitant towards as all of these different technologies just weave their way into our everyday lives and really just learn every single thing about us, you know, with an intent to make our lives better, of course, but is there anything that, that concerns you? Yeah. The matrix. You ever seen the movie? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if we're not, if we're not careful moving into the future and we don't really, you know, people start coming out here treating it like the wild, wild west and just unleashing these types of AIs without really making sure they're secured and stuff, you know, th- that's the only real concerns that I have is I don't, you know, it, I think everybody has that same se- concern is that, that it could get carried away. We could be living in a world where, you know, things could take over things and things could start going haywire. It's gotta be a perfected 
technology and it's kind of, and it's, you know, it's, we got to ease our way into it. We can't just assume everything is going to work. It's got to be tested and it's got to be right. studied. And, and we, we need skeptics. We need them. We need people to look at that sub, uh, objectively. Right. And be right. like, and, and prove it, prove that this is the best thing out there and that this is safe and that this is going to make our lives better. And it's not going to damage anything and not going to put anything in jeopardy. That's, that's to me, the, that's the whole pin right there. That's everything. Right. And I agree with you. And and I think one of the things that I'm really hoping for this time around, especially with a, a technology like artificial intelligence, that I think it's going to be one of the most fundamental technologies that changes the human race when it really gets going here is, you know, we look at the past of things that we've created um, and, you know, I could go into a list of thousands of things, but, you know, we look at something like the atom bomb, right? You know, we knew going into that, that, you know, we, we probably shouldn't be making this, but we're going to do it anyhow, because that's what humans do. We're explorers. We have to figure out what this is going to do, what it is, and, you know, and, and maybe the ramifications of it. But, you know, I, that's just one example, but there's other examples too, where we work and create something without necess- with, without considering the ramifications of what it's going to do. Like, you know, you look at the atom bomb again, I mean, look at the ripple effect that that's had globally, just that one creation that we made and how that's affected the entire world, even up to today. Um, Even something like social media, Facebook. I mean, you know, there, a lot of people tend to give Mark Zuckerberg crap, but you know, when you, when you look at what he was building in his college dorm room in the mid two thousands, you know, they were just creating something to connect people. It was hard to predict you know, what this was actually going to do in terms of affecting public opinion and shared information and different things like that. But then you think about, well, maybe what if they thought about that going into it and and maybe things would have turned out a bit different. So I'm really hopeful that we, we do look at AI a bit differently because, I mean, if we're creating something as intelligent as ourselves, that has to be treated completely differently, in my opinion. And we need to really take a hard look at what are the ramifications of this and and really just the fact we need to do it right. I agree with you. Yeah. And just that whole concept, right? Of pioneers take arrows. Well, let's try and figure out a way to not take any arrows or take as minimal right. as we can. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's kind of what, what my, I think one concern is I just hope we, we treat this one a bit differently. And instead of getting caught up in the fact that we're creating something, you know, that's going to change the scope of our, our species and the world, you know, let's think about what this is actually going to do when, when it, when it does grow and it does become ever present in our lives is, is, is what I, what I'm and, hoping. And like, yeah, like you said, be, be cognitive of everything. Let's, let's look at everything before we just start throwing things out there. Yes, absolutely. So Ryan, as we, as we kind of wrap up our conversation here, I always like to end on, on this one question. What is one thing that you think someone can do today either personally or within their organization to, you know, either begin leveraging renewable energy tech, begin learning about it. What, what is one step someone can take either personally or within their business? I, I think just as simple as looking at the technologies that are out there, everything from your light bulbs. I think people could start implementing LED bulbs should be everywhere and they're not. Mm-hmm. And that still blows me away. We've had these things for years and people still aren't implementing. I think it just starts with the basics. There's little things that we can do. Learn about consuming, or excuse me, um, conserving energies, right? And look at things. And sometimes, you know, it's everything from a, a pool pump and a air conditioner yep. unit and all these things that use and overuse so much energy. It's real simple to look right at, right at home, right within, right, right in our own little world and just individually look at the different things. And I think that, you know, if we had... 1% of a hundred people doing it, we'd make a big difference instead of a hundred percent of one person doing it. You can't, yes. you can't have the 80, 20, we got to reverse it. Yep. I, I agree a hundred percent. I think that is an excellent answer to that question. And again, it's one of those things where I think we live our, we live our daily lives and don't realize how much energy we're actually consuming. Like, you know, we sit at our computers and laptops and, you know, it, maybe it seems minor that, you know, maybe it's a, a smaller screen or, a, a, you know, something like that. But at the end of the day, it's still using power. And not only is that right. using power, your TV's using power, your air conditioning's using power, your Wi-Fi is using power. I mean, every, everything is, is using power. So uh, I yeah. agree with you. I think becoming more cognizant of what, you know, what items in your home 
consume power, if there's a way that you can make that more energy efficient is, is a good initial first step to, to really just becoming more energy efficient and, and taking a hard look at this problem. Yeah, just the management of energy, just everybody looking within and manage, manage your own energy, manage your own carbon footprint, and we can all do, make a serious right. dent in where we're at. Well, and even down to as simple, you know, or, you know, I remember going, my mom was like, never don't leave the lights on in the room when you're not in there. I mean, as simple as that is, I'm sure that makes a, a ton of difference, even simple things like that. Absolutely. No. That's what I'm saying, right? Fantastic. Well, well, Ryan, this has been such a cool conversation. Thank you again so much for taking the time to chat with me. And if anybody wanted to reach out to you just to, to get to know you more or, or talk to you about what you're doing at S2A Modular, what are some of the best ways for them to reach out to you? Yeah, sure. Our, our website, S2AModular.com. We have an excellent FAQ on there. Um, that would really be a great place for people to start. We do webinars if you go to our website and go to events, we do a webinar and it's live every Monday and every Thursday. People can register, sit in, hear what we're doing. The CEO comes on, our CMO Dean that we were talking about. Um, Brian Kuzdas is our CEO. Um, he's on there. I'm on there. And we just kind of go through everything. And it's very educational. Um, we were just talking about what's happening where the where everything's going in the future and um, that's a really good way if somebody wants to get more education and um, they can contact our team and you know that if you if you got one more second I w- I'd like to say one more thing yeah about absolutely it. we've got a really really impressive um, executive team we've, we've got guys in there that you know I'd, I'd encourage people to go and see that you know this isn't a, a, a few people that you know had an idea these these are people that are 30 35 years in the industry. Our, our CFO is amazing. He's worked with Paul Allen, did 52 of his companies. Our COO has been in the building industry for as long as anybody I've ever met. He's amazing. We've got a great architect. Our president, John Rowland, he's an amazing guy. He's a second generation builder. It's really, it was a bunch of minds that came together and just said, hey, enough, we can do this. Mm-hmm. And Let's look at it like that. So I'd, I'd encourage people to that, take a look at our team as well. It's, they're a bunch of really great people and really, really care and they know what they're doing and super knowledgeable. So that, that's the best way to really find out more and they can reach out to any of us right through the website. Definitely. And, and you know, I think like I mentioned earlier, when Dean and I have gotten to know each other quite well over the last couple of years, I, I consider him a good friend of mine. And when he, you know, kind of set up a meeting with me to talk to me about his new endeavor and he started going through what you guys are working on, my mind was blown right away. Um, so I would highly encourage if, if you're someone listening to this and this piqued your curiosity, take Ryan up on these offers to attend webinars and, and reach out to him or, or anybody else because you are, you are going to hear more about the work that they're doing in this really, in my opinion, and of, of course, everything you've heard Ryan talk about is, is going to be the future of, of, I think, homes in the coming decade at least. So um, thank you so much again, Ryan. Really appreciate it and I can't wait to chat more soon. Nick, thanks so much. I really appreciate being on. Great talking with you always. Yep, thank you. Take care. All right, you too. Artificial intelligence, voice recognition, machine learning. Robot. You've been listening to the Artificial Podcast with your host, Nick Myers. Nick Myers. To stay up to date with all our latest episodes, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. To learn more about how your organization can benefit by unlocking the power of AI and voice, visit www.redfox-ai.com. Until next time.